right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Vicki Johnson. I'm the founder and director at Profello. And I have a very special guest today for a video interview. Um, this is uh, Rachel Santos-Zero. And she uh, is someone that I met way back in 2019 when you were just a recent graduate uh, coming out of college. Uh, and you started working in civil engineering, which is what you did your, your first degree in. Uh, part of the reason we met is because uh, you were actually one of the very first students in my fully funded course and mentorship program for graduate school and fellowship applicants. And at that early period, you know, you were applying to fellowships, also thinking about graduate school. Um, and so because you are one of our success stories from the course, uh, now we are still working together and you're actually a coach in the fully funded course and mentorship program. So I just wanted to share your really interesting story uh, today since you've moved from engineering into the field of international affairs. So uh, Rachel, welcome. It's, it's yeah. great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, Vicki. I'm really excited to chat and it's been it's been such a great journey. So I'm excited to kind of talk to you about it. Absolutely. We're going to break down uh, how you got to where you are now, which is actually two things. Uh, first, uh, I know that you're a fully funded master's student in uh, it's science and technology for innovation in global development. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, one. long title. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where, where is actually where you did your uh, bachelor's degree. So you're currently a fully funded master's student there. Um, but you're also a Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellow in Washington, D.C., which is a, a six to nine month uh, work placement in a policy think tank working in international peace and security in Washington, D.C. And I was really excited to hear that you had won this award because I was a Scoville Fellow myself many years ago back in 2005. So now we have even more in common. So um, I wanted to learn more about how you got there, the fellowship itself. And let me just mention um, what you're doing during your fellowship. You're a, a fellow based at the National Security Archive um, and doing work there. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a lot about, you know, what is your day to day fellowship like and also how you're incorporating that into your master's studies. But uh, let's start. Let's go way back um, to the beginning. So uh, you graduated with a, a B.S. in civil engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in, back in 2018. And you began working as a civil engineer. What prompted you at this early stage in your career to think about fellowships and in particular international fellowships? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question to kind of get started with, because sometimes I kind of look back on my path and think I've had, you know, an unconventional path. But I think I've grown up and have always had a lot of multi multidisciplinary interests. And that was a big reason why, why I pursued engineering, but then also writing and international studies during my undergrad. So I think I always knew I wanted to work in this space that combined science and technology and problem solving, but in an international sense, working on policy, because I felt, um, you know, like it was just a great experience to be able to work abroad or, you know, do something more interesting than just doing a traditional engineering job. So I think that's, you know, why I ultimately started looking at fellowships and graduate school opportunities, because they are just such a great way to do research, to work abroad and to think about issues in a more holistic way, which is what I always really wanted to do. Um, and so I had actually applied to a couple different types of fellowships um, around 2019 and 2020. The first was the Fulbright, the U.S. Student Scholarship in Oman, where I had kind of proposed a research track to be able to combine my engineering experience designing bike paths and shared use trails in one of Oman's national parks. Um, and I was lucky enough to make it past the semifinalist round and become an alternate for that program, which I was you know, really excited to even have made it to that stage. And then a couple other fellowships, I applied to the National Public Radio Croc, Internet, Croc Fellowship, which was um, a journalism program in Washington, DC, a year long program to kind of acclimate students who maybe didn't have journalistic experience before, but have wanted to move into the field. And that was you know, another aspiration I had always had. And then the last two were the uh, New York City Urban Fellows Program, which you did yourself, yes. <laughs> um, working in, you know, local government, working on local issues in either, you know, city agencies or the mayoral offices, which I also was able to make it to the semifinalist round of. And then the last program, which I was a finalist for, but they ultimately canceled due to COVID, was the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange for Young Professionals, which was a year-long exchange program in Germany. So, you know, I've always kind of had my sights on lots of different types of fellowships. And I, I just felt that, 
you know, they were always ways for me to kind of move into the sphere of international affairs and international relations that I wanted to do. So, you know, even though the CBYX fellowship didn't work out because of COVID, I was able to kind of pivot and start looking at different opportunities, which ultimately led me to apply for grad school. Yes, this is incredible um, because they all were quite different fellowships, but each unique and had unique experiences. And it's actually pretty extraordinary that you made it to the finalist round of basically all of the fellowships that you applied yeah. for. But I remember when we first met, um, your biggest concern is you just didn't feel like you would be very competitive. Mm -hmm. You didn't think you had a unique story. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what you learned about yourself and the application process, um, mm -hmm. and especially maybe through some of the things you learned in the fully funded course. Yeah, definitely. So I think I felt, you know, again, wanting to pivot into a career that was more international or thinking about, you know, projects outside of just, you know, hard engineering or hard STEM. I did really feel like kind of an unconventional applicant that didn't have, you know, the poli sci or the government experience that some other applicants might had. Um, I did have some international experiences abroad, but again, I just, I just think I, you know, was coming from a place where I didn't feel very confident that I did it wasn't a unique applicant, but it honestly wasn't until joining the fully funded course and in our conversations that you kind of helped me, you know, reformulate how I can think about my experiences and show that I am a unique candidate and that I will provide, you know, this really different perspective that maybe some under, other candidates wouldn't even apply. So, you know, it really, you know, where I kind of started off feeling more self-conscious about my STEM background, I ultimately realized it really set me apart and really made me, you know, a unique candidate to apply to these types of fellowships. Absolutely. I mean, you were bringing that civil engineering background into an international sphere that is unique. So I'm glad mm -hmm. that through, you know, uh, the course and working through your application story, you realized, oh, I do have a unique story to share mm -hmm. here. Um, next, I, I remember, uh, so, you know, uh, unfortunately, you couldn't do the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange Fellowship because of COVID. They had to cancel it. This did happen with a lot of the international fellowships in that period. So lots of disappointing candidates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just doing, a bad time to yeah, apply. <laughs> I mean, some were doing their fellowships remotely from the U.S., which wasn't mm -hmm. ideal either. Um, but, you know, it was probably still great to just get to those finalist rounds. Um, but the next two, you had your eye on uh, graduate school. What prompted um, that next step or that decision to pursue graduate school? Yeah, so I think I, you know, had always had my sights set on grad school at some point. I was, you know, not exactly sure what when I kind of started out in my civil engineering career, but I've always loved school. I've always loved to learn. I feel like I'm a very curious person, and I think I really excel, you know, in that classroom setting. And I just thought, you know, grad school would kind of prepare me and give me those research skills that I wanted, whether I ultimately, you know, end up in academia or end up going more of like a public policy route. I really did feel like grad school was the right step for me to be able to build on those skills that, you know, I hadn't maybe developed in undergrad or I maybe wasn't getting an industry. And I think I gained a lot of really professional skills working as a civil engineer for a few years, but I think grad school just was kind of the logical next step that was really going to allow me to get that subject matter expertise and especially those research and method skills that I knew that I wanted. Yes. And tell us what type of degrees did you apply for, knowing that you had the interest in international mm -hmm. affairs and then this right. engineering background? So I mainly applied for international affairs and international development programs, but then I also applied to um, an environmental policy program, an environmental policy and science program, and then also a journalism program. So I, you know, I applied across a couple different disciplines, which I know isn't the most typical, but I felt for me that I could, you know, really see myself exceed in, or succeed in any one of those programs. I felt like, you know, all of them kind of would give me different things, but I felt like it was, I would be interested in any one of those things. Yeah, did the process of applying maybe help you narrow down which one to choose? Actually, tell us about this next. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you got into multiple fully funded programs, mostly masters, but you also got into a PhD program. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what, what did you get into and then, you know, how did you choose your current program? Yeah, no, that's a great question, especially because the narrowing down process can be really challenging <laughs> for students. Um, so I did get accepted to kind of more traditional international affairs and international relations programs, you know, at um, Georgetown and George Washington. Um, and then I also got accepted to UMass Lowell's uh, Terrorism Studies PhD program. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of really great options in front of me. And then I also had this option, you know, for this newer program at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, where I went for my undergrad. 
And ultimately, I felt like WPI's program, you know, just even though it was a little bit newer, I felt like it really, you know, was preparing students to kind of use science and technology to tackle these bigger problems. So, you know, it felt really innovative. It felt like it really focused on this like transdisciplinary thinking, which I was really interested in. And I felt like it would just kind of give me the tools to best prepare for tackling global problems in a more holistic way, which is something that I've always wanted to do. And um, as you mentioned, you know, the program is fully funded and, you know, I feel really grateful that I had that opportunity to go to a program that was fully funded um, because it gives me the opportunity to work as a research assistant um, with different professors in the department. And it also gives me that financial flexibility to kind of, you know, just have more opportunities, I think, both during the program and afterwards. So that that aspect of being fully funded definitely ended up being a huge factor for me in my decision making. Absolutely. And, you know, for a lot of people, they would have gone for the PhD. I totally respect that you chose the program that was really the best fit for where you want to be right now. But it also sounds like it could if you could ultimately still do the PhD. Exactly. Also, especially mm -hmm. now that you know where the fully funded PhD programs are. Right. Right. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Building that network. So um, that's incredible. So um, tell us uh, a little bit more, what are the most important or eye-opening things that you learned in the process of taking the fully funded course and mentorship program? Oh, there are so many things that I learned along the way and have learned since that I never would have known if I hadn't joined the course. Um, I think, you know, the first thing I is just the structure and the time management skills that the program gives you. It, you know, so many students that go through the program are so diligent and so determined to apply for these programs. And, you know, they're really qualified applicants. But I think, you know, for me, this program really helped me just be able to give myself the, the guardrails to work between and give myself these clear checkpoints to kind of work with, to know that I was totally on top of my applications, especially applying across multiple disciplines that I, you know, was on the ball with them and could put together some really competitive applications. And then the other thing, um, the other huge component for me, like we've talked about, is that, you know, it's just really given me the confidence to know that I am a competitive and qualified applicant for these programs. You know, it's some of these programs, like even the fellowship that I'm on now, the Scoville Fellowship, felt like such a leap to be able to even apply for. And I still, you know, I'm grateful every day that I got accepted to it. But I, I think the fully funded program really gave me the tools to be able to reflect on my experiences and to kind of cultivate them into this story that could show that I'm a competitive, qualified, and unique application for these types of programs. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing is, is that you've always wanted to work in a socially impactful career. And I know that I, I've seen you just grow and be able to show what, you know, how to express the story of what you want to do in your career as well, which mm -hmm. I think has probably really wowed the selection committees too. Yeah, um, it definitely, the, going through the fully funded course really gives you the tools to be able to develop that through line. Because I think, you know, as we're, a lot of us, as we're going through these experiences, sometimes they can feel really disparate or disjointed. And it's hard to know, you know, why one thing led you to the next, but going through this course, it really helps you develop that through line and be able to show whatever committee that, you know, this is where I've been. It's maybe a little winding, but it's actually a good thing. And it's really prepared me to take this next stage. And that's why, you know, at this time right now, it's important that I do X fellowship or Y PhD program. Absolutely. And, and think this, let's talk a little bit more about the Scoville Fellowship. So mm -hmm. even back a long time ago when I was applying, I knew that this was a really competitive fellowship. I mean, they only take about two to five fellows per cohort. They do two cohorts a year. But this program gets hundreds of applications um, and it's still being, uh, it's it's directed by Paul Repson, who's been there even when I was a fellow, which is amazing. Uh, and it's been such a joy to be part of this program that he's running. It's such a unique program. They place all of the fellows in uh, full-time work placements in these policy think tanks in Washington, DC, and as well as government organizations and others. And uh, when I first saw the fellowship, I thought, wow, this is incredible because it's really hard to get your foot in the door into mm -hmm. even into unpaid internships in exactly. these organizations because they just get so many applications. So um, tell me a little bit about the Scoville Fellowship. Why did you apply for it? You're currently an enrolled graduate student. 
Uh, why did you apply? What did you hope to get out of it? And then um, tell us about the placement that you chose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just exactly what you said, having that proximity and that access to some of these, you know, policy think tanks or research organizations. That's something I knew I always wanted and felt like, you know, just like you said, it's really hard to access when you're kind of on the outside of it. And especially again, kind of coming from more of a STEM background, I feel like I didn't have a good way to kind of enter this world without some kind of fellowship or research internship or something. So that ultimately was a big reason why I ended up applying. And, you know, especially just getting the chance to be able to work on you know, these cutting edge issues that are happening around us right now, like climate change or just, you know, other aspects of national security, peace building. I mean, the subject matter itself was so fascinating. And I knew, you know, if, if I could apply to this and be fortunate enough to get in, I think it would really give me the tools to be able to continue on and be a better problem solver and better work on these global issues. So I felt like it just you know, really married well with the type of work that I was already doing in my fully funded master's. And now it just had, you know, this DC aspect to it that I was really looking for. Um, but yeah, like you said, I'm working with the National Security Archive, um, which has just been an amazing experience. They're a nonprofit research organization, library facility, publisher, you know, Mm -hmm. advocate for government transparency. And they work to provide, you know, journalists, librarians, scholars, researchers, with, you know, this trove of declassified and unclassified documents. So, you know, their biggest thing is really promoting government transparency through conducting a multiplicity of research projects and sending Freedom of Information Act requests to different government agencies. So I've really been fortunate that I've gained so many skills, um, especially, you know, these Freedom of Information Act or FOIA requests. Um, I think that's just such a valuable skill that I've been able to pick up that I definitely want to take into my career, whether it's in academia or journalism. Um, and so the two main projects that I'm working on are kind of related to my two biggest research interests. The first one is um, Middle East related. So we're looking at US Iraq policy during the war in Iraq. And then the second project is related to climate and security, which has just been so interesting and so timely. And, you know, it's great kind of being able to delve in how these government organizations are thinking about these types of problems. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and what is it? What other benefits are there from the fellowship too? I mean, you've got this really interesting mm -hmm. work placement. Uh, what else are you getting out of the fellowship? Yeah. So, like you mentioned, we usually have you know either monthly or bi-monthly meetings with policymakers. Um, we it's up to the cohort to kind of see who is interesting to them, and we get to kind of pick who we want to talk to and what type of work we're interested in. And the fellowship, you know, really gives you that proximity and access to be able to talk about people in the field. Sometimes, you know, newer people in the field that are just getting started, and then sometimes more seasoned people who have, you know, seen so many different types of peace building and national security issues. So I think just really having that access to so many different types of work that people are doing down here, you know, academics, people in Department of State, people at USAID, people at nonprofits, it's just, you know, such a great exposure to the type of work that, you know, we could do down here. And then I think also, you know, just the cohort that we have, I think, you know, it's kind of across year to year, these cohorts are just amazing people from, you know, all over all different perspectives. And I think it's really kind of just opened my mind to the types of possibilities that are out there. I do remember that I, I really enjoyed the cohort aspect of it, and mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like the the program's doing even more than than even when I was a fellow so many years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's incredible. Just celebrated mm -hmm. the 35th anniversary of the program. Mm -hmm. Launched a new website. So there's a lot of exciting things going on with the fellowship. Um, I want to ask you as well. Um, some people are doing uh, the fellowship as as sort of their only, you know, like their paid job. Mm -hmm. You're doing it uh, as an add-on experience to your graduate studies. Um, right. Tell us. How is this adding to your graduate school experience and even potentially maybe your, you know, future career mm -hmm. uh, goals? No, absolutely. I think, you know, like you said, I think a lot of, you know, Scoville fellows choose to kind of do it after their undergrad experience to kind of segue them into the working world. But I think doing it kind of how I've been doing it and, you know, separating my master's with this fellowship it's really helping me develop some those research skills that I know I want to kind of incorporate into my thesis once I go back for my second year of my master's. Um, you know, so it's helping me with research skills, with interviewing skills, um, just how to find information, I think, um, and also see the specialists in these fields. So, you know, when I kind of go back to my master's program, I can 
have an idea of who the main people are that are working on these types of issues or the types of other think tanks and organizations that are working on these issues. So there's so many things that I'm really looking forward to bringing back to my program when I go back to Massachusetts. You know, and ultimately my goal for my master's is to work on a thesis that's related to climate and migration concentrated in the Middle East. So I think the two research projects that I've been able to work on at the archive have also really given me a lot of valuable skills and how to think through these topics and think about, you know, what specifically do I want to focus on in my thesis? So I think it's it's a great, you know, kind of opportunity to do in the middle like this for anyone else that's interested. That's great. And, uh, you know, we never know sort of where these fellowships can lead us. I feel like there's always new job opportunities, new mm -hmm. networks that we've developed, but uh, what do you think right now that you'll do after your master's? Do you have an idea? No, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I'm definitely thinking about it all the time, always trying to think about, you know, what my next move is or what, you know, the kinds of things that I'm interested in. I, again, I'm always looking out for fellowships. I'm constantly checking the ProFellow database to yeah. see what's there. <laughs> um, you know, I really am looking at a lot of journalism fellowships um, that I think would be really interesting, especially kind of as this segue from the National Security Archive work. Um, and with these FOIA skills that I've gained, I think that would really, you know, be a nice transition and then, you know, I'm also just thinking about pursuing a career in academia and, you know, going for that PhD. I really feel myself kind of gravitating, gravitating towards these issues of climate and migration. And I think that could be re something really interesting to explore in a PhD setting, whether I ultimately, you know, go into academia or end up taking more of a policy role. I think a PhD would be really beneficial kind of in those areas and to be able to just, you know, be an expert and talk about something. So... Oh, that's excellent. Lots of potential pathways that you can move into. And since you mentioned it, yes, let me put in a plug for the free profellow.com database because you actually found a lot of your fellowships, uh, if not all of them, through the Profello Definitely. database. And even, um, you know, we also at Profello, we teach about how to find fully funded programs. They're not necessarily that easy to find. A lot of it is speaking to admissions, figuring out who offers graduate assistantships. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's another thing that we really try to teach at profellow.com is how to find these programs that offer funding. Mm -hmm. But yes, if you're not already in the database, everyone should sign up. It's a free database. We currently have more than 2000 fellowships um, and fully funded graduate programs included. And you can even in the fellowship realm, there's professional fellowships, summer fellowships, doctoral fellowships, master's fellowships and postdocs. So there's lots of different opportunities. Um, and the great thing is, is you can pursue, pursue fellowships all throughout your career. So uh, Rachel, she's looking for more fellowships post degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's great. So Rachel, um, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your journey, kind of where you were a couple of years ago, where you are now. Do you have any uh, final thoughts or application tips that you mm -hmm. want to share with aspiring fellows and aspiring graduate students? Yeah, definitely. I would say, you know, the three biggest pieces of advice I can offer are start early, you know, you know, start if you're looking at fellowships, if you're looking at grad school applications, start as soon as you can, um, because that'll really, you know, give you the time to be able to put together a competitive application, especially, you know, if you're applying across disciplines, if you're applying to multiple different types of fellowships, it'll really kind of help you do the application justice to be able to take the time to hone in on those personal statements those research proposals and, you know, getting, you know, letters of affiliation if you need it. Um, and then the second piece of advice I would say is don't be shy about reaching out to people, whether it's, you know, admissions, whether it's faculty members, alumni of, you know, grad programs or fellowships, they will all kind of help give you a better window into what this program is going to be like and if it's a good fit. And they'll be able to kind of give you those tips um, to just you know make, make your application the best that it can be. So just you know any any advice that you can get from people that have already gone through it or people you know faculty members definitely don't be shy about reaching out to them because they're there to help. Um, and then the last thing that we've already kind of touched on is just be confident in yourself. Um, just know that you are a competitive applicant and that you're looking at these programs for a reason because they're of interest to you. And even if they seem like a reach or they seem really competitive, don't be shy about, you know, really going for it. And this course will really help give you the tools to be able to do that. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel, so much. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, I'm really excited to see where you go in your career. And I'm sure we'll stay in touch for a very long time. 
So yeah, thank definitely. You so much, Rachel. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me, Vicky.